Hello everyone, this is David Brennan here from A Block to Watch with Ariel Adams looking at what we should talk about tonight, which is this newfound vintage watch trend in the watch industry. Is it really that new? Or how like let's let's put a start date on this. I want an exact moment that it all started. Uh, I guess um something like maybe two years ago. I, I wouldn't say more than that. I think it, it got really, really bad this year. Uh, last year it was ho hum, like some of it was happening at its usual pace, but this year both SIHH and uh, and Basel where it was just Okay, out of so this is interesting. So you say that and what's interesting is my response because I feel like this has been going on for about seven years now. So I'm wondering why we, we, we disagree by about five years here. I think it's the severity of the problem. It's it's not whether or not it existed because it totally ex it existed. That's right. But look at this. Like even even Psycho. Look at this. It's like the first Psycho recreation. Uh, well, look, the Japanese finally, you know, caught on to what's going on, are doing it their way, but they realize that nobody wants them to do that, at least not in an expensive way. So what I'm looking at right now is the uh, blog to watch Basel 2017 coverage where Technically, we decide what we want to cover from Basel, but if the watches are, you know, we, we can decide, you know, what the watches are that uh, that make their. Debut. There's so much we haven't covered. I mean, this is this is barely representative of the Basel World stuff. I mean, that's this is minuscule. I mean, the funny thing is, this is there are eleven pages here with uh, say about ten articles on each page. So what we're looking at here is actually more. Oh, like... that's that's nice. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that's just my connection. Here we go. Okay. So what I want to do is just go. Just, so, just so like explain what you want to, what what you want to achieve in this conversation. Like we want to have more conversations where we get to a point. The point of this conversation is the topic of vintage watch re-releases and so forth. What is the, uh, what is the message we want to get to? The message we want to get to. Well, I, of course, I don't want to tell anyone what to buy or not to buy, but I do want people to look at it in a little bit of a different way and ask themselves the question, is it really that great or that amazing of a trend, uh, what is happening these days with vintage watch release? Because what I see is if someone, like some important brand, finds a model or a collection that they had discontinued a thousand years ago and re, uh, relaunches it now, the majority of the people uh, or the watch, or, you know, the watch enthusiast community is folding all over themselves, liking it. It's like, oh, this is amazing, the same red text and the, the same fonts or the same case or whatever. But it's from okay. 70 years, uh, years ago. I yeah. have a lot of things to say on this topic. I agree that it's frustrating, and I think you see it throughout all of culture. We are in the era of the vintage re-release, whether it's movie, television show, product, toy – car watch like people love it when you take a something that they liked from the past but owning owning it today is impractical for me the first vintage re-release was the volkswagen the new beetle okay that was in the 90s that's a good point and that began the oh my god old stuff is cool again and it was all about making new versions of old stuff in various different ways and you had a bunch of these things you had you know, some failures like the Ford T-Bird, the Thunderbird that was cool, but not, you know, but, but today you had, you know, the, the American muscle cars, you know, the Challenger, you know, and, and the Camaro and things like that, and the Mustang, they all have a modern yet sort of vintagey look to them. So the watch industry always being inspired by the car industry and because you have certain models like the Porsche 911 and the Rolex Submariner, and they always say that the Submariner is like the Porsche 911 of watches because it's like slight improvements on the exact same thing. And they saw that there was this very admirable market for this. It wasn't just about the collectors. You know, we have to remember these brands are notorious and not listening to other people. It's a it's an ego thing. They want to celebrate their history in a in a way that's so. I guess severe, there is no future for them because they inherit these brands, right? We're talking about designs that people made um, long before any of us were born, for the most part. So, this notion of you work at a, a watch brand today, you kind of just are a caretaker of the image. So, nobody feels comfortable doing their own stuff. So, there's this comfort in just redoing old stuff, but using all the machines and, te and technology we have today. And that's 
in a sense, some of the issues, like some Omega watches are like that. It's exactly like that. It's like, here's the design that we inherited, so it's okay to use it, plus this movement we just came up with, which is pretty impressive. And that's some, but that's a weird side effect of, of juggling this notion of having to advance the machine while preserving the image. Um, so I think it's it's very easy for people like you and me to get really upset by it because we know that it's inherently kind of cheating because they're they're saying something is new, but at the end of the day, it's not really new. So we feel deceived, um, and I think a lot of customers feel deceived. Anyways, I've talked a lot. Your your turn. It's it's p- partly deception. I agree, but also to some extent. It's just this lack of creativity, and not just not just deception, but looking at the uh, the customer, the modern customer, and saying, "Oh well, you know, they will like it. They're they're dumb. They will. We don't have to do anything new. They will like it anyway." That's a lot of the times when we were meeting these major major brands who did nothing this year but but vintage releases, or maybe six new models, so so new models, five of which were loosely or very strongly uh, based on vintage watches or vintage models. And there are a few exceptions here and there where I find it creative, like this Omega Speedmaster, for example, that we are looking at here that I, I just randomly stumbled upon. So this is a completely new movement in a new case size, in a new design with, let's say, a vintage like chronograph seconds track, or they call it a minute track, but it isn't that. So that is pretty cool. I like that because it's the the color scheme and and some design elements are you know harkening back to the original, but mostly it's a new watch. So that I like. But I'm not saying everything has to look like this or has to look like this Casio. But sometimes it's just it's just way over the top. And getting back to where I started, it it's just it's just lazy. And they're like, oh, you know, they will like it anyway. It's like they their fathers liked it, their granddads liked it. They you know whatever. We can sell truckloads of this. We don't have to do anything new. And well, well, so let's let's yeah. let's get to let's get to an important issue, and that is not explaining what they're doing, but explaining what they're doing and why it is irritating or upsetting you, right? Like, I think the issue is there's some vintage re-releases that we like, and there's some that we don't. But there's something about the practice which irritates you and some other people. So I guess what I want to do is answer. What is it that bothers you about it? Maybe it's the same thing that bothers me about it. But let's answer that question. What is it? That, uh, I just I just said what what bothers uh, me about it. it I, I feel it's lazy, and I feel they they look at me as a customer and say, "Oh, you will like it. We did this long time ago. How dare you not like it? This okay. is history." Okay. So no. So so what you're saying, and this is important. You feel that when they come out with something like that and use the word "new" to describe it, it is insulting the expectations of you as the customer yes i mean look at this for example like oh we just put like a sunny side of egg on the dial which (laughs) nobody ever thought when it was being made that it looked good at all it had a certain functionality it has zero functionality these days it's well into the five figures i imagine how much is this let's see i can't wait to see oh of course oh fourteen thousand because they are like, oh, oh well. Hey, hey, but remember, for only watch 2017, you can get this exact same watch, <laughs> slightly nine. more yellow. For nine. <laughs> well, let's, okay. So, so when I look at this, I feel like there's no added value whatsoever. I'm not a Navy diver. I'm not a fantasy Navy diver. I don't. You're, you're not? I'm, well, <laughs> it's a secret life that I'm not allowed to talk what? about. <laughs> <laughs> so when I look at this. I'm like, okay, what, do, what does this tell me? It's like, we've been making this watch for a long time with a black dial, but we know you've been eagerly anticipating the moment when they put this egg on the dial. And now we did it. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> well, look, look, look. Let's, let's be honest. You know, there are these collectors of these vintage watches that in many instances are relatively rare. And the brand is always trying to answer the question, what do we do next? So if you put them in a room and you'd be like, okay, guys, I got a great idea. Well, on the one hand, these vintage watch collectors that we don't really understand, but we we monitor their activity, are buying your old sports watches, okay? This is one that you made, and we have to come out with something next year. How about we come out with this? Because it's part of our DNA. And everyone looks at each other and be like, we can do this and not have any risk whatsoever. Exactly. So we just <laughs> we just want another year. <laughs> also with 2018, here we go, because we don't have to do anything this year. 
Stay yeah, and then they're like, here. you know, I mean, it's only a matter of time before these brands start to get desperate and start to like forge old documents. Be like, oh, we found something from the fifties. We had no idea we could make one of these now. This is, I mean, again, I like Alpina a lot, but this was this was for me a, a low blow. Okay, so when this so when this happened, we didn't even write about it because because I was I was just so infuriated by it. Because of a certain German armed forces that was uh, <laughs> yes. the sole wearer of these watches? <laughs> no, I, I clearly remember the email when I received it. And I spent a few minutes just reading it because it was a long press release email or whatever. But it sure was. I mean, it's like, well, how did you know we produced these watches between 1939 and 1945 for the German military? <laughs> That's exactly what you should bring back these days. <laughs> this is a, this is an example of marketing millennials because the marketers are assuming the millennials don't know any history. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh. I would I would suggest to say the millennials are sharper than that, and they know what a black and white military picture alludes to. Yeah, well, I hope they do. They better do. I mean, this one, for example, look at this. This one. Is a magnificent design, bar none. It's 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 fantastic. It should exist, but it should have always yeah, for existed. for 1961. It, yeah, but it's still a nice design. It, I think, isn't it? Okay, it, okay. Here's the thing with Seiko. Every single year, they have more vintage re-releases, and I have no idea how to tell them apart. They could like they could tell me one that they came up with like three or four years ago, <laughs> and I would be like, really? But that's. You know, that's the funny thing. That's exactly what I'm saying. This always should have existed. It, it should have never gone out of production. It went out of production. Now it doesn't bringing, seem bringing like back. it ever really did. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, just not seeing a lot to do here. I mean, look, I, that's, the one, that's one of my favorite things to do is you go to some of these vintage watch stores in Japan, mm. and, they, and they love vintage Japanese watches, of course, too, and they have their own sections. Like, they won't mix vintage Japanese and vintage European. Like, they're not allowed to be in the same case. So you see this, like... Grand Seikos of all these eras, and they just blend together. It's like an ocean. Mm. It's just like all water. Like maybe a slightly different color here and there, slightly different mm. shape, but it's all water. It's <laughs> tell, all me, water. tell me apart the, the right one and the left one. For you. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> what has a blue second to him? Uh, platinum. Platinum. I know, I know, but still, it could, it could even totally be, like, realistically be a completely different model. <laughs> Here's the thing, Seiko, when Seiko does it, I get more angry than when the Europeans do it. Because when the Why? Europeans do it, I feel like that's just that's just what they do. Like, that's the culture they were born into. Because it's not just watches. It's everything they do is, like, perpetuating the past, perpetuating tradition. The Japanese are very forward-thinking. So when a Japanese watch brand goes ahead and, like, obsesses over its history, it in a, in, a, in a kind of way, like goes against what other Japanese companies at least seem to do. Like I've never seen like a vintage re-release of a Lexus. <laughs> like they've never looked backwards in time. Neither has Infinity. Like Japanese, like like Sony. I mean, I guess they keep the Walkman name around, but when it comes down to it, it's always about moving forward. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I said you know this should have been around in the sense that it's such a basic go-to dress watch that it never really goes out of fashion um, for some reason they stopped producing it fine they're bringing it back now fine but it shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of Grand Seiko releases for for this year I mean what, what else we have here this was I think and to some extent also a vintage re-release or tribute thing this one I think that was a tribute to the unwearable dive watch. Oh, okay. So that that's that's the one. And then we have this, <laughs> which is larger than it has ever been. Because for some reason, brands are obsessed with making their watches from fancy new high-tech materials like ceramic and whatever in huge sizes only, like Hublot with the Magic Gold. It's only 45, no 42s or no, no nothing smaller. In ceramic, like Panerai, it's extremely so difficult you, to you, find. You like a smaller watch than I do. Sometimes, not all the time. So, you know, it, that, that's true. But for me, I'll, because everyone knows me as being like the big watch lover, I will say, and again, this is ironic because the average watch size purchase in Japan is significantly smaller than, well, not significantly smaller, maybe two, two to four millimeters smaller than other places uh, or like the West. 
Um, I'd say like 38 to 39 is like very popular in Japan, whereas in America it's probably 40 to 42. Anyways, the bottom line is that Seiko, for whatever reason, has a lot of watches that do not fit the vast majority of Japanese wrists and don't fit on my wrist or David's wrist. And so like that's fine and all, but like they're always been a, they've always been about practicality. It's like they make they, they make some dive watches, for example. Like you have to be wearing a silly large wetsuit for it not to look silly on you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this chrono, like I, I own the uh, one of these Grand Seiko chronographs with the exact same movement, actually. And it's a it's it's a couple millimeters smaller. It's still a massive watch. It looks like a fillet mini on the on the wrist. I, I I like to joke about it. It's like it's basically like this. Uh, like a piece of like meat, like a fillet or something on the on the grand wrist. It's like, it's, steako. It's like grand steako, exactly. <laughs> here, for example, steako. like where do I find the size of this thing? It doesn't tell you. It doesn't want you to know. They're that, embarrassed that watch, about it. That watch is way too big and unnecessarily so. It gains nothing. It gains, okay, so listen, this entire conversation was supposed to be about vintage re-releases. Now you're looking at the opposite of that. And now we're moaning about Seiko. Yeah. Now we're moaning about Seiko again. <laughs> Every conversation. Okay, we get have, sidetracked here. Everyone needs to know this has to include a little bit of love and hate for Seiko. We love Seiko, but Seiko does things we don't understand, and we it frustrates us. Why, Seiko? Why? Exactly. We love Seiko um, so much. Look, so before we have this conversation, I wanted to focus on the element of collectability and I'll call it future desirability. Now, a lot of these vintage re-releases you're talking about are considered because the the authentic originals, i.e. the vintage ones, w were in demand. The question is, does a vintage re-release of a model that itself was popular and collectible itself have a chance of becoming popular and collectible? Mm. Um my gut instinct says it's really difficult for something that is designed to be an homage to be as uh, as popular as the best. So for example, you have the Eiffel Tower. And let's say another city says, like 50 years later, said, we're going to build an homage to the Eiffel Tower because we really appreciate it. Does the second Eiffel Tower have even remotely the same inherent value as the first one? Of course not. Definitely not. But that's kind of the watch industry is doing you know, at least to me. And yeah. I have to say that while there's a lot of, it's like a lot of these are like the best made version of those designs because the older ones are too small or too fragile by today's standards. And yeah. so they look great, but their prices, they're just so high. Like I think all the, vin the vintage re-release watch market needs is to cut their, their, their MSRP by about 70%. For the vintage watch market? What do you mean? For the vintage re-release, meaning oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. the problem is is that watches today are proportionally so much more expensive in the past that they no longer be able to be sort of like fun once in a while items for guys. Like it used to be that a, a watch was like buying like a new suit. Like yeah, you couldn't do it all the time, right? But every couple of months, if you wanted to buy a new suit, you could do that. Now, it's like a car or a house. Like if you want to buy like a, a watch that costs a suit. You're not getting something that's nearly going to match a suit of, of 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 around the same price. And the funny thing is, right? if you if you buy a suit for like let's say let let's say a high price, let's say two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars, it's going to be one of the best suits in the world. Okay, yeah, you can go all crazy and spend twenty thousand dollars in a suit if you really want to. But if you spend more than a few hundred, you spend a few thousand, and it's going to be tailored and it's going to have a high quality fabric. It's yeah. going to be one freaking amazing suit. And if you look at a watch, oftentimes with a, with a, a bought-in um, movement from Salido or whatever, and it retails for four or five thousand, it's not going to be even remotely close to the best watch. Not in that segment, or just you know, just in comparison to the others. So yeah, the prices are just crazy these days. So I think that that's one of the material things that is really, really, I guess you could say, holding it back is that the. The nostalgic item that yeah. the new item attempts to be was in a different price category altogether. It was, for example, if the new Beetle came back not as a car, more or less excessively priced as the original was supposed to be, or it was, of course, yeah. but as a $100,000 performance car. Yeah. It would have totally missed the mark. Yeah, that's a good point. Exactly. And that's kind of what's going on. It's kind of like you know, the Datsun is coming back as a supercar, 
but it looks like a Datsun with the same personality and the same look, and there are other supercars that are around the same price. Yeah, but are actually Who's going to buy the Datsun? No one. They're going to be like, this isn't what we remember. We <laughs> wanted this to be like the, afford- the affordable, you know, like Far East, you know, little little sports car that's cool and does a lot of what I want um, in, in, a, in a great, reliable way. It's kind of like what we want Seiko to be. We don't want $10,000 Grand Seikos. Those are called European luxury watches. We want amazing stuff at prices that the, that the Swiss have kind of abandoned. That was always the charm. Here's the most fitting example. Seiko. Um, with this IWC that was launched a couple of days ago, or maybe last week, whatever. And it's $4,150 with a Celida inside with, with one out of 1948 written on it. It doesn't even have like a proper, like, just give give it a number. I mean, you know, this is not, I, I don't really like it when it's it's one out of. I mean, the I'm, watch needs to be thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's four thousand. And you know what? I agree that it, and IWC cannot allow themselves to sell a watch for thirteen hundred dollars. Not because they wouldn't make money on it, but because it would destroy the prestige and whatever else in the brand. But then go out of your so way long, and so make long prestige. And well, go out of your way and put better value in it. Make you know, just make the case nicer. Make it, I mean, I cannot make any accusations with regards to where this watch and how this watch is made. But for four grand, considering the competition for eight hundred bucks, this is way up there. I mean, I think this basically is a watch for pe- for people who wander into the store. I think maybe this is for Harrods or whatever. Who who wander into a store and say, well. This is I like the design, which is easy to like. It has to be said, it's it's an okay design. Again, from it's a great Adar. design, but it's not a luxury watch. It's a beautiful like field watch. It's a exactly. tool watch. Exactly, that's right. So so they like the design, and they have the sort of money, and they want to be able to say that I'm wearing an IWC. I'm not wearing this or that. I'm wearing an IWC, and then because here's here's the thing, and it's easy to miss this part of the conversation is that. Is that people are spending this sort of money because they want to be able to communicate to their peers that they actually bought a watch for four grand. And when they when they see that you bought an IWC, you're telling other people, I could burn four grand on this and I didn't have to buy one for eight hundred bucks. That only works the first time you buy the watch. Then if you like watches and you buy more, you you start to realize these things are expensive. I may want to sell them after I own them for a while to get more. Because these things are expensive, and because they're expensive, and I'm not an idiot, I want my dollar to go as far as possible. So I'm going to be discriminating and make sure I get the most bang for my buck because watches are freaking expensive. So it only takes a little bit of interest in watches from someone to go to the situation that you just described that does happen to, whoa, 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 you mean I can get a better value? Yeah, or good luck for selling this one. You know, look. Oddly enough, because this original design was so demanded and appreciated, and if this one's done well, it could do well. Look, IW, I've never seen one of these in person. IWC could screw up in a bazillion ways. The hands could be too shiny. The case could be the wrong size and fit oddly. There could there could be some issue. You know, it, it, it does happen. Like this this has the potential of going great, but it could also be screwed up. You know, they they cheaped out on on, on some type of thing again. With the cost cutting going on, even at the big brands these days, I wouldn't be surprised. But assuming it went for a great price, um, yeah, it's going to be collectible, but it's going to be several years before it goes for anything you know appreciative. I mean, I think four thousand dollars is is a high amount, and it's understood to be an entry level model for IWC. But if they translate entry level to be like skimping on as much quality as possible to make their other stuff look better, I think it's going to really prevent it from having a lot of future appeal. Yeah, that's very well said. And also, this is basically a tribute to another Mark, whatever. You know, I don't, I don't even bother remem- remembering this. I don't, uh, it was I honestly, like Mark Twenty Seven at this point. It's you see, this is the Mark Eighteen tribute to Mark Eleven. <laughs> so you couldn't make that stuff up. It's it's basically uh, it's how does that even work? And you it know, can be interpreted so many ways. I- imagine imagine the prop or the probably quite condescending way they could they could enlighten you about why that makes sense it doesn't make any sense okay it, it's just it's just like 
Was this the Mark 18 of tributes to the Mark 11? Like there's there's been 17 other ones before this that have tributed one watch? Like what does that mean? So basically Mark 17 was a tribute to Mark 10. Mark 16 was a tribute to Mark 9. <laughs> <laughs> and it all goes back to Mark 1, which was just a lonely, sad watch in World War II. <laughs> With countless attributes. <laughs> all you right. can only get rid of them if you kill the original. <laughs> This is the fact that they named it another mark is just hilarious to me. I mean, maybe maybe it's just us two, but but I think it's pretty funny. All right, IWC Mark Watch. Moving on. (laughs) Oh oh my. Okay. So (laughs) no more Seiko. Let's let's look at let's look at at the other end of the spectrum. Um, What? positive examples can we bring so basically my question is what is it that happens look at this for example uh, so what is it that happens when brands try and do something new does it always go well or does it you know why why is it that they don't do it that often many people are shaking their head right now no what do you mean well you have this ubelo right there which is is I don't know how I don't know how the how the future will treat this this is an interesting looking masculine watch this is this is not a pretty watch. The watch that I'm seeing on the screen right now, this particular Hublot, which is complicated and definitely original and evolves the collection in a a different divergent path. But this is But like this this watch looks like a, a I I mean yes, it, you always say it looks like a face, but pe- a lot of people look at this and because it doesn't immediately look beautiful to them, and it doesn't have shapes and things like that that eventually will be more familiar. Yeah. They're just gonna they're gonna say ugly. They're gonna say it. I don't think it's ugly. I don't think it's pretty. It's not classically pretty, but I wouldn't call it ugly. But this is what this is what happens when they try to go innovative. So so many brands want to play it safe. Look, you know their egos are involved. Yes, yes. Here you go. Yes, it is the screaming woman. Yes. Where is it? It's here. Oh. So it's it's exactly that. I mean, I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I like this watch, and it's a Biaxio Tourbillon that's ridiculously expensive. Nobody cares if it if it sells or if it doesn't sell. I'm pretty sure it will sell. Actually, it's one sixty nine for a Biaxio Tourbillon that doesn't look like anything else. Has a super complicated, awesome case, awesome looking movement. I like it a lot. I'm not saying this shouldn't exist. What I, what I was more asking about was main collection pieces and and how those age like take for example the uh, hold on like the sky dweller for example like when that came out that was like one massive uh watch for rolex it's one of the most complicated watches and this year what what rolex did was bring out this one in two-tone which i really genuinely like with this champagne dial but something A- is- aka the, the date just annual gmt yeah, exactly, exactly. But I, I like it a lot. This is this is an amazing watch. It's a little bit large, but it's still pretty cool. And the thing is that I put together, and I may be totally wrong here, but this watch has been on the market for a couple of years now, in exclusively in gold, retailing for forty, fifty thousand dollars. And now in two tone, it retails for sixteen or even less in white gold. Actually, it's like fourteen or something for the for the white I gold. I have gold. to say, I am so upset for Rolex that gold is costing them so much money. Okay, but consider this: the <laughs> the the gold case, the solid gold gold case. You could buy this in yellow gold or whatever. I presume had less gold in it than this watch with the solid gold center links on the full bracelet. I'm not. You're trying to expose an inconsistency. You have succeeded. Well, that and also to say that this watch has been on the shelves for a long time in all gold, and they needed to, you know, reduce the, the price. So I guess they repurchased a lot of the stock, uh, took out the movements, which were of course per- perfectly fine, unsold movements, freshen up a little bit, put them in this case, and sell them again. And, and the movements are cool. Oh, oh yeah, and and the way the bezel works and the clickiness and the the, the incredibly beautifully over engineered clickiness to it is just incredible. Where does it rank on the clickiness scale? This is off the charts, okay? This is off the charts. In we clickiness. have to write a new scale now, David. Another clickiness scale. In it's like every couple of weeks. This redefines. This just redefines the bezel clickiness, 
And so back to the original point, this was a new design from Rolex. Look at that off-center uh, circle there for the for the uh, for the GMT, and it's just such an unusual watch and an unusual design. How will this go down? In well, not history, but uh, over the years, how will this be regarded as? And that's that's I think what we should consider when brands do design new stuff and not you know, freshen up stuff that they made in 1956 originally. This is what happens. It's going to be a little bit different, but I do very much like this watch for that because it's not your average everyday Rolex. It's something new that they, they actually did something new uh, this time. And I can appreciate that. Okay, so that. Let, me, let me say this, and this is one of the things that I've always found about appreciating vintage or vintage style more than modern. You know, and, and I've said this to you, but I'll say it for this conversation's purposes, if you go back in time and you sift through everything and you're able to pick and choose the things that have aged nicely, you're in a, you're at an advantage. You can look back at a complete body of work and, cho and choose among the best. But the stuff that comes out today, you don't have the benefit of being able to apply the test of time. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what's new that's going to end up being continually appreciated or that's going to be perceived as a fad and be disregarded and people that liked it will be scrutinized scrutinized as, be, as being silly it's conservatism that in my opinion makes it people makes people feel a lot more comfortable choosing a vintage style that has endured the test of time versus trying to evaluate each new design and asking themselves do I like this because it's new and shocking, or do I like this because it has a lot of inherent design value? That's harder to do, and very few people are able to do it consistently, consistently well. You know, sometimes I'll do a review of a newer watch, and people are like, that's the – I love how often people see the ugliest thing. Like every single week, the bar goes up. Oh, that's the ugliest. No, it's not the ugliest. It's just something you don't immediately see. And so we do these – reviews of these watches and people are so quick to criticize but you never see that if something looks familiar if something looks familiar people are like that's nice i like it but if it's new and ask them to like make a, a judgment they're like i have to i have to like evaluate something new new now i have to think how dare you how dare um, you so, yeah this is not comfortable i don't feel safe here yeah and so it's like it takes courage to take risks on new designs and appreciate things you haven't seen before i'd like to think that i have developed some of that courage and and because it's I'm okay if I'm wrong if I end up liking something for a while and later on I realize it was a temporary inf infatuation and I was wrong I can admit that and it doesn't hurt my ego I don't care yeah exactly but this also brings us to a discussion <laughs> that's for another for another sh uh, for another show is when you're buying a watch and when you're wearing a watch who do you wear that for is it just for your own entertainment or you're trying to communicate to somebody about yourself something about yourself. I, it's never this or that I only. I just wrote eight, eight eight pages on that yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. So eight <laughs> glorious Ariel Ariel pages that people which have I will through. edit and end images too. So I will read it very yes. soon. Yes. Yeah. So I I want to know that I appreciate the audience's time reading my <laughs> diatribes, <laughs> but I put a lot of effort into them. I really do. Yeah, it's, it's my it's me being a academic of sorts. So I think we should wrap this up soon because it's getting really long now. But I think we addressed some of the vintage re-releases. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with some of the new stuff as well? I think uh, let's 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 have some takeaway advice for people because I think that they're still going to be attracted to a lot of these or misunderstand how seriously to take them as a buyer. So maybe you can give some prescriptive advice as you know to potential buyers on how to navigate this market and things like that. You give you say something and then I can say something. Yeah, sure. So I think um it it really comes down to how many watches have you owned and have you purchased so far? If you if this is one of your first watches, you are probably better off going for uh, something that's more of a safe and tried design just because it's extremely difficult to find your own taste and and be able to tell apart what is it that you can appreciate or what is it that you can like in a new design and what is it that is just a passing fancy that you think oh this is the coolest chronograph pusher ever and then you buy a watch for for a quirky design feature and then you end up not liking it two weeks later so make sure you mature your taste and 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 your critical eye and move into uh, more bunkers and more um, interesting designs later on. I think that's 
that's a good thing. And also, by the time you have owned a few watches and a few years have uh, have come past, you will get bored by all these old designs and tributes to Mark One to another Mark. It's it's extremely difficult to stay interested in these things for a long period of time. Buy one of these, enjoy wearing it, feel safe doing so, and then make sure that when you grow um, bored with all of this, uh, have the courage to move on and, and please yourself with a nice watch that you find interesting and you're wearing for yourself and not for somebody else. That's, that's my piece of advice. Okay, so on the matter of uh, vintage re-releases and things like that, I am extremely skeptical of the idea that these vintage re-releases will have collectible value in the future insofar that they are going to be in-demand pieces that demand a price premium. They are not original designs. Some of them have popularity because they look good for what people want right now. I don't know how well they will age compared to the authentic originals. Um, I think they'll always be around, but I don't think that the prices, you know, I don't think they're going to go up in value from the retail price. I think they're going to be going down. And likewise, I think the brands are charging a lot of money for them. So some of them are fun. Some of them are beautiful. In fact, a lot of them are fun and beautiful. But be very mindful of the amount of money you spend on it because you really want to get – I would rather someone get a watch like a Rolex Submariner that has been perpetually made for so long. You can't call it a vintage re-release because they never stopped being made. So it didn't exactly. become re-released. So be more skeptical of the re part of it than the it already – constantly existed um once in a while you'll see one that just looks great and from a conservative standpoint if you like kind of simple tool watches like i do there's some of the best looking sport watches coming out right now and that's fantastic but again got to be aware of pricing because a lot of times given the way the market works with distribution demand in a lot of ways does dictate the price some things will go for very hot. Some things will go for uh, not that much. And if something's very hot, you are in a good position to wait a couple of years. And, and if you pay attention to the market and what's out there is pre-owned stuff, you'll likely get the watch you want at a price that you were pro probably quite happy with. It's lower than retail. Um, I think that – and I've written about this before in how I think that watch brands are robbing themselves of the future. They should be mixing – the production of these re-releases with new stuff, which is inspired by today. If they don't come out with watches that are related to the time that we live in, there will be nothing for them to rehash in the future. So if they like this idea of rehashing their 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 past by making new versions of it, what are they going to remake from today? A remake of a remake? <clears throat> no, that's, that's not going to have market appeal then. It's not going to have story value. So at some point, they need to get um, making new stuff. And we may be living in one of the last times ever where the vestiges of the old watch industry with its large manufacturing capacity exists, where this volume of these types of watches are made with this specific type of quality and things like that. I think that while the watch industry is going to perpetuate, in the future it's going to be much smaller, like legitimately smaller with much less manufacturers and things like that. So there, there's a really important time now to make traditional style watch with new designs and i only think we've got a, maybe two more decades of that last left maximum okay that's what i think about that okay well that's that's a really nice summary there i think we can wrap it up for today before the mark 24 tribute to mark 18 tribute to mark 11 watch comes out <laughs> mark x <laughs> mark we don't bother counting Is that anymore mark 10? no it's mark x but it could be 10 if you want to see it that way. We understand. Just add a lot of random Roman numerals to, to, the, to the title and, and you'll be you know, done. You know they have like – you know the IWC watch is like it's, – it's like big pilots apostrophe S watch. It's just like Mark's pilot watch. Like who's Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Mark's pilot watch. Mark sure knew how, what he was Mark? doing. He Where has a lot Mark of watches. From? It's from our history. I promise you. We've had a lot of Marks in our history. <laughs> <laughs> all right on that note i think it's time to wrap it up thanks guys for joining and uh catch up next time thanks everyone